The Chrysler Corporation was on a roll in the later 50s. Suddenly, they were at the forefront of futuristic design, so much even that it turned into an all-out designer's war. But as soon as 1960 rolls around, Chrysler starts to make rather peculiar design choices and proceed to create cars that look weirder and weirder as the 60s wore on. What happened? How did this came to be? And when did this stop? Welcome everyone to the 18th episode of the Automotive History series, where we're going to take a closer look at the history, but also the design philosophy of the weird Chrysler cars of the early 1960s. This episode is somewhat of an extension of my very first episode of this series, the Tilfin Wars of the late 1950s, and I recommend you to watch it, as we are now going to take off where that episode ended. Still though, I am going to give you a very short rundown. <gasps> Here we go. With the introduction of the 1948 Cadillac, you too could get a touch of airplane or space rocket on your car in the shape and form of tail fins. Throughout the early 50s, it was only Cadillac that had them where they were noticeable. The 50s were known as the Space Age, and the general public became more and more infatuated with the space race, space exploration, and space technology. And so did the American car makers. I always like to say that it became somewhat of an unofficial contest who could get the most aircraft and space rocket references on their cars without making it look like an actual spaceship. And this is where Chrysler stepped into the picture. In the mid 50s, Chrysler made cars that look a lot like me. Good build quality, but boring to look at. <laughs> When it comes to styling, Chrysler always lagged behind. That was until they hired Virgil Exner. And remember the name. Exner set up the forward look design movement so to make Chrysler cars more exciting. Soaring fins, jet pot taillights, space stone greenhouses, rocket motors and a touch of googie style with a way to go. You could now buy the future on wheels. Suddenly, it is 1960. Suddenly, Chrysler was at the forefront of modern American design. But now what? Really, Chrysler didn't see this coming. Like I mentioned, they always lagged behind styling-wise, and that's part of some conservatism a long story. Whenever something new came around, Chrysler was one of the last car manufacturers to adopt it, but now they introduced something new. In 1960, Chrysler became a styling leader, but they weren't prepared for it. Because in 1960, a transition was already happening. People became fed up with the way overstyle wannabe rocket ships with oversized tail fins. I guess you get what I mean when I show you a picture of a 1959 Cadillac, 59 Lincoln and 59 Imperial, which is part of Chrysler. Excess is an understatement. A clean, uncluttered, an unfuzzy design was the way to go in the early 60s, perfectly portrayed by the 1961 Lincoln. Seriously, this was the way to go. But Chrysler, still thinking they were the styling leaders, were having none of this. I say Chrysler, or was it Virgil Exner? Exner couldn't get over the fact that what made him name and fame in the 50s was hopelessly old-fashioned in the 60s. Massive fins were so 1959, and Exner called the new cars he was supposed to design plucked chickens, because they had no tail fins. While still head of the design department, he tried to take revenge on Chrysler management by coming up with the weirdest design concept. I guess this whole story is best explained by me showing you some pictures of concept cars that were made for the upcoming early 60s production models by Virgil Exner. And I love these pictures. You have to understand that this is like pornography to me. So let's get to it. I'm just going to show you pictures with some commentary. Start rolling! This is the design studio, alright? This is where they uh, draw and, and make the uh, concept cars or design studies for the upcoming production models. Some of the models on the floor are either functional or non-functional. Some are just clay models, so they lack an engine, transmission, etc. But they are made to just give an idea at, uh, well, really, does it look good or not? Uh, Next slide, please. What you're now looking at is the design proposal for the 1962 
Plymouth. And it still has those aircraft and, and spacecraft type of uh, references, especially at the outer headlights. You can see they are placed in what is inspired by the afterburners of uh, the new jet planes. But don't you worry, this is one of the least radical of the designs. Uh, we're going to step it up a notch, so next slide please. Thank you. This is the new design proposal for the 1962 Imperial. And uh, if I look at the rear end, it has a weird connection with the 1955 Imperial with those uh, bullet shaped tail lights on top of the rear fenders. And then there are the headlights that are kind of mimicking the jet engines that are uh, placed under the wings of an airplane. So yeah, next slide. <laughs> this is where the good stuff comes in. Look at this. Dual headlights were the way to go, but you know what? We're just going to, to slice them in half. Two of them are just going to be placed within the grill, and then we're going to surround the grill with a, a very weird body line, and then way out into the distance, way up in the corners of the car, we're going to put the other set of headlights. What were they thinking? And it just doesn't end there. It will get better and better. Next slide, please. These are some of the experimental clay models you're looking at, and they they were seriously considering to make an asymmetrical car. I'm not making this up. Just look at it, you know, you, your standard headlights on both sides of the car, and then you just have like a pot with two of them, which are not in the middle, but completely off center. Or here, for the rear end, you know, no license plate in the bumper, not in the middle of the car, no, just all the way to the left. Once again, what were they thinking? All right, I, uh, I guess we've seen uh, enough for now. Because how do these concept cars translate to standard production models? I mean, you, you, cannot, you cannot sell this, okay? You cannot sell an asymmetrical car. What made it to the production phase and what didn't? Well, I'll show you the actual production models. Although there are plenty of examples, I picked five, which I consider the worst offenders within the Chrysler lineup. One from every division. And we'll start off with Valiant. Valiant was this new car company that was supposed to be somewhat of a grocery getter or an economy car, if you will. It was like a junior car, not as big as the standard full-size American sedan. And the more you start to look at the side profile, the more you start to notice the body lines just don't match. Especially the station wagon is horrible and a mismatch of curvy and straight lines. This car had to compete against cars like the Ford Falcon, but the Falcon was a car that people wanted. Simple, uncomplicated, straight line and maybe a bit boring, but they wanted this and not this. Next up is the 1961 Plymouth because it's a beautiful example of a plucked chicken. The year before it had huge fins and now they're just completely gone. But look at the front end. Much like a dog, this car lets owners say, oh, you can touch it, it doesn't bite, but you know damn well it'll eat you alive. Look at that menacing grin. Uh, by the way, have you ever noticed that this car has a Lexus-shaped grill way before Lexus even existed? Yeah. You can't unsee this, now can you? <laughs> and what about the rear end? The tail lights are like jet pods, moved all the way to the side and leaves the whole rear end as a blank, wide open space. I mean, huh? Next up is the 1962 Dodge and, and should it even be mentioned? Look, dual headlights were the way to go in the early 1960s, but not this way. It's like Dodge couldn't decide whether they wanted to place them inside or outside the grill, so they compromised, and not in a good way. The lamps aren't even on the same height level, and somehow the car looks pissed off. Now the side profile is... whatever, same old, same old, body lines that just don't match, you, you get it. The 1961 Chrysler is a little more interesting. The car still had huge fins in a time when they were already abandoned by almost everyone else. It looked more like it belonged in 1957 than in 1961. And I'm not a huge fan of the headlight arrangement, but that's my personal taste. Overall, it's not too bad, and I consider it one of the least offensive designs, but just, you know, it's outdated. The 1961 Imperial is probably the worst offender. My eyes hurt. 
It was supposed to be a perfect blend of futurism and a kind of old world elegance, but I see a train wreck combination of 50s, 60s and 30s. 50s as in still huge fins on the back with jet pot tail lights, 60s as in a formal and angular C pillar roof that just doesn't match with the bubble top like greenhouse, and 30s, that's right, look at the front end. Are these futuristic jet like headlights or are they just a subtle reference to the 1930s headlights and is this one of the first attempts of retro design? You tell me. But it should not go unmentioned that Virgil Exner made revival type designs in the later 60s that incorporated 1930s design influence. If you want to know more about it, take a look at the Neo Classic video. And I'm not the only one who wasn't all too happy about these cars. Chrysler also wasn't happy as customers stayed away from dealerships because of these weird looking designs. Chrysler fired Virgil Exner in 1961 and replaced him with Elwood Engel. And that is the guy that designed the 1961 Lincoln I talked about earlier in the video. The car that was the template for 60s car design. And as soon as he went to work you could see that in the cars that came out in the mid 60s. By 1965 Chrysler went back to normal so to speak. And all the cars had a more clean, generic, straight line and less radical and weird design thanks to Elwood. Elwood gave Chrysler cars the Lincoln treatment. I mean, take a look. The 1965 Chrysler looks quite similar to the 1965 Lincoln in terms of shape and overall design. Maybe I was a bit too harsh on some of these cars. Honestly, I secretly like some of these models that were shown, much in the way I like pimpmobiles. They look so bad that they start to look right. And let's not forget that they were made in a different time period. They were at least unique and didn't try to chase other car maker designs, for a short while at least. I think some of these cars perfectly capture the spirit of the early 1960s.